This is a Scream Queen production. I'm Jen Carpenter, and this is So Dead Podcast. Happy True Crime Tuesday. Who's ready for some dead time stories? It's Halloween week, which makes me so happy, but also kind of sad because my favorite time of the year is almost over. Although, as I have explained to you guys many, many times, it's always Halloween for me. Every day is Halloween, especially now with my creepy little bookshop nestled in a building with several other creepy little shops. It is all horror all the time. Horror not horror. I know I'm bad at that word. Blame the Michigan. Anyway, for normal folk who aren't obsessed with the macabre, this is just the time of year to tell ghost stories, to scare each other with urban legends, and there's one from a small Michigan town that's truly terrifying because it's all true. Ascoda is a quiet little lake here on Beach Town located in northeast Michigan. If you're looking at the mitten, think like the upper part of the index finger, I guess. Uh, With a population that never gets much higher than a thousand, it's the kind of place where everyone knows everyone, which makes what happened there all the more shocking. October 31st, 1969 was an eventful day in Ascoda. First of all, can we just all agree that Ascoda Ascoda (laughs) is the most Michigan word You can say, like, even if you aren't from Michigan and you don't have that dreaded Michigan accent, you're still going to sound like you're from Michigan when you say a word like Oscoda. So October 31st, it was Halloween, obviously, which meant costumes and school parades. I fucking miss school parades so much. I liked being in them when I was little. I loved going to them when my kids were little. I miss them. Someday, my kids are my kids are grown now, so within like the next decade, there will probably be grandkids and school parades will come back. Hurrah! That was really nerdy. Sorry. <laughs> so parades, trick-or-treating for the kids, and then of course, parties and underage drinking for the older kids. But it was also homecoming, which means there was a football game, a parade, that whole crowning of the king and queen thing. Maybe a dance, who knows? I didn't see a dance mentioned in any of the articles, but there was a lot of stuff not mentioned in these articles that I used for this story. Lots going on. So people were excited when they woke up that morning. But things went sideways pretty quickly. That afternoon, a bomb threat was called in to Ascoda High School, and by that evening, two local girls were missing, never to be seen again. Pamela Hobley, who went by Pam, was born May 24, 1954. She was raised by a single mother and was close with her mom and her siblings. On Halloween 1969, she was 15 years old, 5 foot 8, and 115 pounds. That's really tall and really skinny. She was a lanky gal. She had hair so dark brown it almost looked black, and she had big, intense brown eyes. She was known to have a rebellious side. She drank, smoked weed, skipped school, and was so serious about her boyfriend that the two had recently gotten engaged. At 15, she was 15, that's crazy to me, but I mean, it was the 60s, right? That morning, Pam dressed in a plaid skirt, a blouse with ruffled sleeves, a white faux fur coat, and white knee socks with wedge heels. If that is not an outfit that screams 1969, I genuinely don't know what is. She went to school, attended her classes, and was looking forward to both the homecoming game and the Halloween party that she was planning to attend with her fiancé that night. She promised her mom she'd be home right after the party, but she was known to play fast and loose with her curfew. It was just a normal day for Pam in little old Ascoda. Until the bomb threat. Patricia Spencer, who went by Patty, was nearly a year and a half older than Pam. She was born January 10, 1953, and was a bit more straight-laced. She followed the rules, got good grades, and was close with her family. 
On Halloween 1969, she was 16, 5 foot 3, lot shorter, 125 pounds, with blue eyes and light brown hair. That morning, she dressed in a brown knit sweater with a matching skirt, a gray and green plaid jacket, wedge heels, and a necklace sign with a piece on it. No, no, not a necklace sign, a necklace, just a necklace, a necklace sign, a necklace with a peace sign on it. Again, how 1969 can you be? She went to school, attended her classes, and was looking forward to both the homecoming game and the Halloween party she was planning to attend that night. The same Halloween party Pam Hobley was going to. It was about 2 p.m. when the bomb threat was called into the high school. Everyone was ushered outside, and then once the all-clear was given, students returned to class to finish out the day. But not Pam and Patty. They were spotted walking away from the school down River Road toward Escoda's business district in their little plaid and fur coats, skirts, and chunky heels. One would assume that they weren't planning on being gone long as they left their purses, money, IDs, and backpacks in their lockers. Pam's fiancé was pissed when she didn't show up to homecoming, but that anger turned to genuine concern when she stood him up for the Halloween party she'd been so excited about. He tried calling her house, but her mom was out trick-or-treating with her little sisters. When Pam's mom returned home, she had several messages on her machine from Pam's fiancé, and she immediately knew something was wrong. It certainly wasn't unusual for Pam to go missing for hours at a time, to not be where she said she was going to be, to stay out late without calling, to miss curfew, but she was always with her fiancé when she did these things, so for him to not know where she was wasn't normal. Her mom started calling around to Pam's friends' houses, and after a few calls, she came to a horrifying realization. Pam wasn't the only one missing. Another girl, a grade older than Pam, had disappeared as well, Patty Spencer. Now, here's something important to note about Pam and Patty. They were not friends. They weren't not friends, like they weren't enemies or anything, but most of the witnesses later interviewed by police said that they didn't think the girls even knew each other. Last fall, right about this time, I told you guys about the 1976 disappearance and murders of Stacy Roast and Maureen Nichols in Bath, Michigan, nearly a three-hour drive from Ascoda. Stacy and Maureen were best friends, so it made sense that they would be together, and it was a plausible theory that maybe they'd run away together or taken off with some ne'er-do-well together and met a grisly fate. I mean, it wasn't really plausible because some of the other facts of the case, but The fact that they were together was not a red flag. But for Pam and Patty, this was the biggest red flag. Why would two girls who barely knew each other walk away from their high school together in the middle of the day and just disappear, leaving behind their families, in Pam's case a fiancé, all of their belongings? Patty didn't even take her glasses. And you can't see without your glasses. It makes no sense at all. But police did the thing they always did back then, and they labeled the girls runaways. They said they believed that the girls had hitchhiked to Flint and were hanging out and partying there. I just, it boggles the mind. Boggles the mind. I can't even imagine how their poor families must have felt. So I'm going to put my little tinfoil hat on here for a minute with some theories, so don't mind me. A. The degree to which the police did not give a fuck about these two girls who were essentially strangers disappearing on the same day makes me wonder if there was some sort of cover-up involved. Two, the bomb threat. Back then, there wouldn't have been a reason for this to really cross anyone's mind, but now in 2020, we've seen it, unfortunately. We've seen everything now that it's 2020, haven't we? Fuck. Um... We've seen situations where a bomb threat was called in or a fire alarm was pulled to lure the students outside to be ambushed by a school shooter. It happened at Parkland. Uh, A fire alarm was pulled to get everyone to run outside. And actually, um, not too long after that, we had a very personal experience here. My son was a student at Grand Ledge High School, 
and a bomb threat was called in. And, you know, once upon a time, bomb threat, everybody outside. And now in this new world where there are school shootings every other week, that's the bigger concern. So a bomb threat was called in. They locked down the school and kept the kids inside where there might be a bomb because they were more worried about what might be outside. Hurrah for homeschooling this year. Don't have to worry about any of that for a change, right? Jesus. Get it together, fellow humans. So, did someone call in a bomb threat to get all the kids to go outside to maybe corner a couple of girls one by one at the same time, pull them into the woods, pull them into a car and take off? Like, was that the intention there? Who knows? In theory C, um, this involves a piece of information that I haven't really shared with you yet, but Ascoda was the nearest town to Wurtsmith Air Force Base, which was in operation for 70 years, from 1923 to 1993. At its peak, there were 3,000 military personnel stationed there, so three times the number of people that even lived in Ascoda stationed at this Air Force Base. So, once again, to bring more recent news in as an example, think about all the shadiness going on at Fort Hood as of late, which I've got my whole own opinion on that. My husband was actually stationed at Fort Hood when we started dating, so I've spent a lot of time there and in the surrounding towns. And Anyway, that's a different story. Point being, we know that shit goes on, and now that we're paying attention and we're laser-focused on Fort Hood, people are going missing and getting murdered left and right. We know that the military likes to cover these types of things up. So that brings us again back to the idea, was there some sort of cover-up? Could an airman or an airman, an airman or a member of the military, someone who was just passing through town, have been involved in some way? And that's why there were never any clues, because the person involved didn't stick around to get caught? A horrific fact to support this theory a little bit, uh, Eric Harris, one of the Columbine shooters, lived in Ascoda in the early 90s when his dad was stationed at Wurtsmith. He attended third and fourth grade at an Ascoda elementary school. The town was actually featured in Michael Moore's Bowling for Columbine. So yeah, Ascoda is a small town, but there are all kinds of bitty... <laughs> Biddy. Biddy is the new word for big city, guys. Just FYI. Have fun with that one. Um, there are all kinds of big city people and big city danger passing through. Or there were, at least, until the base shut down in 93. So these are all 100% unsubstantiated theories, by the way. They're just thoughts that I had when I was working on this story. Take them or leave them. You should probably leave them. Anyway. Two teenage girls who went to the same high school but did not run in the same circles disappeared on the same day under the same suspicious circumstances. Their families insisted something awful must have happened to them, but the police were having none of it. They labeled them runaways and basically did zero investigating. So the families took up that gauntlet. They plastered the town with flyers, put up billboards, offered rewards for information— but the case went nowhere. And then a couple years later, it happened again. Police don't believe these two cases are related, but I definitely find it worth mentioning that another teenage girl from Ascoda disappeared not even three years after Pam and Patty. Charlotte Loomis was born March 24th, 1958, so she was a few years younger than Pam and Patty. She would have been about 10 or 11 when they disappeared. The Loomis family was big and dysfunctional AF. Charlotte's mother, Rose, had five children with her first husband, Burton Loomis. Two girls, three boys. When her husband died, she got remarried to his brother. And they had three more kids together, the oldest of whom was Charlotte. So Charlotte was the oldest of the second round of kids. That marriage ended in divorce, and Rose married a third time to a man named Louis Dinan. Louis had a son from a previous marriage, and then together, he and Rose had three more kids. So that is 12 
motherfucking children. 12, which was normal in like 1920, but not in the 60s. That's crazy talk. Word on the street was that Charlotte did not get along with her new stepfather, who was said to be a drinker. So in 1972, when she was 14, she went to spend some time with her sister cousin, Carol, for the summer. Get it? Sister cousin? Because they had the same mom, but their dads were brothers? Yeah? Okay. All right. Carol was 15 years Charlotte senior, so if I'm doing my math right, she was like 29, 30. And she was living in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey with her new husband, Thomas Friday. (laughs) That sounds like a reporter's name. I'm Thomas Friday. So Charlotte went from living on an Air Force base to an Army base. She stayed with the Fridays for the summer, but then she had to return to Escota before the new school year started. On September 1st, 1972... Carol and Thomas dropped Charlotte off at Newark International Airport for a flight bound for the Midland Bay City Saginaw Airport here in Michigan. Allegedly, Charlotte's stepdad, Lewis, went to the airport to pick her up, but she was nowhere to be found. Curiously, though, her luggage did arrive at the airport. Like Patty and Pam, Charlotte was classified as a runaway, although her case was slash is being handled by the Eatontown, New Jersey Police Department because that's the last place she was seen. So different police departments handling the cases. All of the girls, though, from the same tiny town, all classified as runaways. Charlotte's family never seemed too interested in finding her, but they did hurl a lot of accusations back and forth. Charlotte's parents accused her older sister, Carol, of hiding her, of dropping her luggage off at the airport. So... That would, doesn't make a lot of sense if you've started flying, you know, post 9-11. But pre-9-11, airports were like the wild, wild west. People were just all over the place. You could walk right up to the gate. You could walk onto the plane to give your kid one last hug. It was madness. So it was plausible then. It wouldn't be now. But back then, you absolutely could check luggage in under someone else's name. You could probably even have checked in under someone else's name and nobody would have paid any attention. So the fact that Charlotte's luggage got checked in and put on the plane and sent to Midland doesn't mean that Charlotte herself was ever on the plane. So the family accused Carol of making it look like Charlotte had flown home and really keeping her there with her in New Jersey because Charlotte had apparently run away a lot. She threatened to run away a lot. She didn't like living with 200 siblings and an abusive stepfather. Um, So she was believed to have just stayed with her sister. At least that's what the family said. But Carol called poppycock on that. She said she absolutely put Charlotte on the plane. Charlotte definitely made it back to Michigan. And uh, her stepfather allegedly, accusedly, Uh, must have done something to her after he picked her up from the airport, took her somewhere, did something with her, and then went back to the airport and acted like she never showed up. There were allegations, never substantiated, that Charlotte was being molested by her stepfather, and that was why she wanted to live with her sister. Whether that's true or not, and obviously I certainly hope not, it is widely accepted that Charlotte didn't get along with her stepdad, So it seems like an odd choice that he would be the one to pick her up from the airport after she'd been gone for months. Whatever the case, Charlotte was gone. Pam and Patty were gone. Ascoda, a town of less than a thousand people, had three missing teenage girls on their hands over the course of less than three years, and nobody seemed to care a whole lot. Cut to four decades later. In 2010, Ascoda Township Police Chief Mark David, who was from Ascoda, he lived in the area, he was 12 when Pam and Patty went missing, so that would have put him right around the same age as Charlotte. He probably went to school with her. Uh, He reopened the case into the two older girls' disappearances. I mean, I guess it was never really closed, but no one was actively investigating it. So he, what do they say? He breathed new life into the case. And he decided to investigate one long-held local rumor, which was that Pam and Patty went to a popular party spot for local teens that fateful Halloween day, a barn owned by a man named Jack Searle. It was said that two men who were also at the party barn 
killed the girls, and buried their bodies beneath it. In 2011, Chief David brought in cadaver dogs and backhoes, the whole nine yards. He searched the property, but they found nothing. Still, he kept pushing, asking for tips and sharing the girls' story in the news. In 2014, a man contacted the police department to inform them that the story they were putting out was wrong. The girls weren't last seen walking away from the high school because he'd seen them after that. He encountered them hitchhiking together, and he gave them a ride to the gas station on US-23 and River Road where he worked as an attendant. He went into the building for his shift at work. The girls went off in the other direction, and that was the last time they were seen. When asked why he waited 45 years to come forward, the man said that he'd gone to the police right away when he saw on the news that the girls were missing. He was interviewed extensively, even remembered the detective's name that interviewed him. Yet there was absolutely no record of his statement or his interviews. His name wasn't on any witness lists. Nothing. Which brings us right back around to my theory about some sort of police cover-up. Halloween is this week, which means it's been 51 years since Pam and Patty disappeared. Tall, skinny, dark-haired, dark-eyed Pam Hobley would be 66 years old today. Petite, curvy, blue-eyed, light-haired Patty Spencer would be 67. Their families believe they were likely murdered the day they went missing. But their quest for answers continues, and Pam's sister still puts flyers up around Escoda to this day. It's been over 48 years since the disappearance of Charlotte Loomis. She would be 62 today. At the time of her disappearance, she was 5'2", 115 pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. And that is the story of Michigan's Halloween mystery. Thank you for coming to my dead talk. My sources for this episode might surprise you because they surprised the shit out of me. I Always, 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 as you guys know, use newspapers.com because I like to put my own facts together using articles from the time versus someone else's more recent version of the story. There were zero, zero articles about Pam and Patty, zero articles about Charlotte, none. That's how much this was swept under the rug back then. Every single article I found was published within the last 10 years or so. And it's madness. Madness, I say. I did get some information from Wikipedia. I got some stuff from the Doe Network, the Charlie Project, and a website called Whereabouts Still Unknown. You can find a full list of resources on the So Dead page for this episode on the website. I know this has been a bit of a short episode, you guys, and I am super mad about it because we're talking about not one, not two, but three missing girls. There was just so little information out there, I didn't have a lot to go on. Do better, Ascoda. Not like, okay, calm down if I've got any Ascodian Ascodian listeners. Not Ascoda today, because it seems like the current police chief, he's on it, he's committed to bringing whatever peace he can to these families. But if someone could like hop in a time machine, travel back to 1969 and knock that fucking police chief upside the head, it would be greatly appreciated. All right, it is time for me to answer a listener question. And I'm actually going to answer a few today since this is such a short episode. This first one comes from Angel. She asked me a question that I actually get asked all the time. So I've been putting this one off because I've yet to figure out a good way to answer it. The question is, why are we as a group so (laughs) obtet... No, she didn't typo it. I typoed it with my voice. Um, Why are we as a group so obsessed with true crime? I don't fucking know, Angel. I don't know. Um, I, I get asked that a lot in interviews and things, and I don't have an answer. I've heard, you know, because it makes us feel powerful, because it helps our anxiety to know what's out there and all the possibilities and blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's true. And I think for me, it's just always what I've been interested in. You know, the the darker stories, the, I, I don't know, the human condition, the tragedy. I'm just a 
dark individual. I when you've been, <laughs> when something has been your interest for as long as you can remember, it's hard to say why. It just is what it is. Why do I like tacos so much? I don't know. Why do I still like Kraft macaroni and cheese out of the box? Don't ask me that question. I've liked it since I was a little girl. I just fucking do, okay? It's okay, Angel. You can ask the question. That's just my answer. I genuinely don't know. What do you guys think? What's your reason? You tell me. You like this shit too. All right. Here's one from Rebecca. (laughs) Rebecca wants to know, what was the defining moment that made you turn to hauntings and ghost stories? Again, always something that I found fascinating, but being a skeptic, that's a little a little less. You know, true crime is facts and real and you can look it up and you can see pictures and these are real people and this is real stuff, real life. Uh, hauntings, a little less so because a lot of it's fake, a lot of it's made up, a lot of it's up for conjecture. But I would have to say the turning point for me was definitely living in a haunted house and having things happen that I absolutely could not explain away. It was quite an experience. It has led me down the path that I'm on today, so I definitely wouldn't change it. But I do sit back and think sometimes about how grateful I am to live in a house that's at least not that haunted. We have little creepy things happen here and there, but nothing at all like what used to happen in the other house. So I I think that was the moment. Okay, last one for today comes from Katrina. She asked, what's your favorite kind of taco? You're just, Katrina wants to get me in trouble. I wish I could give you some bomb-ass authentic answer. Uh, The truth is, I am the whitest white girl on the planet, and I grew up eating white people tacos. We're talking (laughs) Ortega Ortega taco seasoning mix. We're talking taco shells, not tortillas, shells, uh, shredded craft cheese, sour cream, maybe some shredded lettuce if you're feeling fancy. Like that was what I grew up eating. And so to me, that was a taco for a long time. Um <laughs> One of my favorite little Mexican restaurants that's right around the corner from my little bookshop. I just like to say that. I'm sorry. Uh, It's called Pablo's and it has Mexican tacos and American tacos. And I really think they should just change the name on their menu to white people tacos. Yeah. So I like them simple. First and foremost, I think we've talked about this before. Cilantro tastes like soap. Can't do it. Can't be involved in that mess at all. And my tacos have to have cheese on them or I simply won't eat them. So um, I would say restauranty, local, uh, Pablo's, their, their American tacos are really good. No tomato though. Tomatoes are also gross. And then uh, Ella's Teco I think has my favorite ones because they're not too seasoned. I love their tortillas and the cheese is all melty. Yeah, I like their ground beef tacos a lot. So there it is couple things real quick before I go. My newest adventure, Dead Time Stories, True Crime, and Other Books, is officially alive and kicking. It is a Michigan-centric true crime and paranormal bookshop in the heart of Old Town. It's a part of Thrift Witch's Dark Art Market, and it's located on the lower level at 1219 Turner Street in Lansing. Hours are Friday and Saturday from 12 to 7 and Sundays from 12 to 5. This weekend is the last weekend that I will be there full time. After that, it'll be kind of hit or miss. I'll still be there most of the time, but I do still have a day job to tend to, so I can't be there all the time. So my suggestion to you, listening ears on, if you're planning to make the trek from afar to visit the shop, uh, feel free to send me a message. Ask me if I'm going to be there on the day that you're planning to come. I really don't want anyone driving from, say, Ascoda and then being pissed that I'm not there. Also, if you're from the Lansing area, you are familiar with the Top of the Town contest run by City Pulse. You like how I'm just telling you that? You are familiar with this. That was supposed to sound a little bit kinder, like, hey, you're probably, you know. Um, You guys have probably heard of it. Top of the Town. Final round is right now, so it's the top five 
vote getters from round one in this final SmackDown, best of the best. I guess top of the town would be a better term for it. That's why they call it that, right? Anyway, voting is underway. So Dead made the top five for best local podcasts in the best whatever category. Category. Uh, Let's just keep it moving. Uh, A Festival of Oddities made it into two categories, both also under best whatever. Uh, Best local art festival and best local event slash festival. And Demented Mitten Tours made the top five for best haunted attraction under the best hangouts category. So one for Demented Mitten Tours, one for So Dead, two for a Festival of Oddities. Uh, If you just Google City Pulse Top of the Town, it should come right up for you. You can vote in as many or as few categories as you like, but I would appreciate it if you would just take a few minutes and go vote for So Dead. Either way, it's an honor just to be nominated. All right, now I think that's really it. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. I'm horrible at Pinterest. I shouldn't even be saying that anymore. And YouTube at So Dead Podcast. Please check out the Patreon page for ways to support the show financially. And you can find that at patreon.com forward slash So Dead Podcast. And be sure to visit SoDeadPodcast.com for all of your So Dead merch. As always, you can email me your feedback and story ideas to SoDeadPodcast at gmail.com. A new episode is coming your way in a couple of weeks. And just a quick reminder, it's almost time for winter break. So two more new episodes coming your way in 2020. And then a little break and then we'll be back for season three at the start of January. Super excited about that. I'm working on some new stuff for you guys that I can't wait to unveil and share. And, you know, I like to be dramatic about it. But anyway, stay safe, stay sane. And until next time, keep shining, you magnificent what the fucks.